Hello everybody, uh, good afternoon and welcome to this Institute of Osteopathy webinar. My name is Matthew Rogers and I'm going to be running this webinar today. I'm Head of Professional Development for the Institute of Osteopathy. I'm just going to wait for another couple of minutes. We're expecting a few more people on the, uh, the webinar, so we're expecting uh, a few more people to join. I'm going to give them a few more moments before I kick off, if that's okay. Thank you for you. Okay, hello and good afternoon everybody. My name is Matthew Rogers and I'm Head of Professional Development for the Institute of Osteopathy and welcome to this Institute of Osteopathy webinar looking at developing a mentoring support structure for osteopaths. This webinar is entitled Professional Support at a Time of Need because the skill sets that you're going to learn about on this, um, on this webinar uh, may be critically important over the coming weeks and months when we think about relaunching our clinics after the current situation has run its course. So this course is run in association with the Osteopathic Development Group. 
the ODG is a national initiative designed to bring together some of the major organisations in osteopathy to work on a number of projects that are designed to develop the profession for osteopaths and our patients. And mentoring is a subject that they are looking at at the moment. One element of this course is funded by the Osteopathic Foundation. The OF is a charity designed to further the profession by funding education and research. And obviously mentoring is an educational tool. Uh, and we're very uh, grateful to our charity partners for their support in that. This webinar will go on for about 45 minutes. We're gonna look at uh, a lot of the tools that you might use if you wanted to take on a mentee yourself. Uh, we're gonna look at the benefits to you as the mentor and uh, the benefits to the profession. We're gonna go through some de definitions of mentoring as well so that we're all working from the same uh, hymn sheets. At the end of the session, I will provide you with my email address. So if you have any questions, if you write them down, if you email them through to me, uh, I'll do my best to get through each of those individually. If there are some common questions that come up, uh, I will create a frequently asked question sheet that I'll email around to everybody, uh, but we may not have that much time to answer questions at the end of this webinar. Uh, I will also be suggesting some self-directed learning tasks that you might choose to uh, do if you wanted to further your understanding of mentoring at the end of this session. So again, if you write those down, those all classes CPD, so it might be worthwhile giving those a go. This course will provide you with an introductory level to mentoring. For those of you who have already mentored uh, another colleague or an osteopath in the past, this is more a refresher for you. So uh, it may, uh, you might find that there are a few more tools there and structures that you haven't really thought about that can add to your repertoire. For those of you who haven't mentored before. This is really designed to enhance your understanding of mentoring and build your confidence to take on a mentee. And this course is supported by a mentoring toolkit. So that's a document that covers everything in the slides. Um, there are also a lot more um, tools and uh, templates that you can use to mentor a colleague uh, and that's freely available to download from the Osteopathic Development Group website which is osteodevelopment.org uk or from the mental matching uh, template that I'm the mental matching platform that I'm going to be talking to you about a little bit later on so now it's uh, more important than ever that we do come together as a profession to support our community we do know that about 60 percent of us have already taken the very difficult decision to close our clinics with the re ma majority of the remainder uh, being limited to remote consultations for patient safety but this might be a huge opportunity for us to come together to take stock and to learn from others so that we are in the best possible position to relaunch our clinics when this is all blown over. So we do think it's critically important for osteopaths to get involved in this process, take on a mentee, take on a mentor, so that we're stronger than ever before after this, this uh, current situation has blown out. Interesting. So, I just thought I would start off going through a bit of the background uh, of, about the research that we've conducted uh, regarding mentoring in the past that uh, forms the basis of this training. So back in 2012, there was some independently conducted research about mentoring. And we know from that that specifically new graduates do often struggle with the transition between uh, the, uh, the training institutions, the university setting and professional practice, with only about 40% of us feeling supported in our first three years of practice. But it's not just new graduates that struggle, in fact about 47% of us would say that they would like to access mentoring if the opportunity arose. But we know that only about 16% of us are actually doing that at the moment. Indeed, of those who are providing mentoring at the moment, only about 14% have actually had any training in mentoring. So what that means is that there are some very good case studies of how mentoring is conducted. There are some less good case studies and a lot of variation across the profession. So the research that I've just mentioned came up with a number of recommendations, one of which was to develop a, an entry level mentoring training program for osteopaths that could be disseminated across the profession. Uh, that would include definitions of mentoring so that everybody has their, is working uh, on those same definitions and there's a degree of standardization across the profession. 
It went on to suggest that it should be supported by a mentoring toolkit, which as I said, we have now published and it's on the Osteopathic Development Group website. Uh, and it also suggested creating some form of online matching software that would help those who are looking for mentoring to find that sort of professional support. Um, so that's what we've done, and that's the bit that the Osteopathic uh, Foundation has actually funded. We've created an online platform for osteopaths to find other osteopaths who are prepared to mentor them. It's free to access. I'll give you the link at the end of this uh, session. Um, and we're encouraging all osteopaths to sign up to that because we know that, as I said, for, of the 47% who are interested to be mentored, uh, the majority of them said that they didn't know where to start and where to find that mentor. So that, that platform provides that uh, networking opportunity. Reassuring, reassuringly enough, we do know that over 70% of us have said that we would be willing to mentor others and share knowledge uh, in this way if this sort of structure did exist. So I think that's uh, very encouraging to start with. So the objectives of this training is to build a support network for the profession to decrease professional isolation and to support reflective practice within osteopathy. But what is mentoring? So uh, again, as uh, I mentioned a moment ago, from the research, we do know that there are lots of different definitions of mentoring going around. Lots of people refer to mentoring and mean something else entirely. So the suggestion was if we created a, uh, a research-based definition of mentoring, uh, then we'd all be working uh, from the same song sheet. So this is the uh, definition that um, the research came up with. And uh, it's a bit wordy, so I'm going to go through it and I'm going to pull out the important points for you just now. So the definition suggests that mentoring is a structured personal development relationship where a person, the mentee, is guided by a more experienced person, the mentor, often in the same profession. I think the most important part of that is it's about a more experienced person supporting a less experienced person. It's not necessarily uh, an older person. It's not necessarily somebody who's been in the profession for longer. That really depends on what the mentee needs support with. So if they are a new graduate and they want support with their, their clinical skills, then having mentoring from somebody who's been in the profession longer makes a lot of sense. But certainly at the current time when we're all thinking about how we will relaunch our practices and the clinics, uh, we may be thinking about how we might use social media to do that, how we might make the most of our websites, uh, how we might develop our public speaking skills so that we can talk to potential patient groups. And it may be that you're the principal of a clinic and your new graduate associate who's just started with your clinic has much, a much better understanding of how to use social media in that way, for example. And it may be that in that circumstance, they're the most experienced person and they're mentoring you. So that's something to bear in mind as uh, whilst we go through this process. Uh, the definition continues that mentoring is a collaborative relationship built around dialogue and questioning. Now that's really important as well, because as a mentor, you're not expected to know everything about everything. In fact, you can't really know everything about everything. But the mentor's job is to support your mentee through their own decision making processes. So uh, you're there to provide uh, impartial and non judgmental support and advice uh, and act as a critical friend or a sounding board for them to bounce ideas off of so that uh, they can develop their own understanding of the situations. So you're not necessarily there to, to answer all the questions for them. You may signpost to other sources of information, of course, but if they came to you, Let's use the example of somebody who wants support developing their career, uh, career development advice. Uh, then you may ask some questions such as, um, well, what do you enjoy most about your career at the moment? Which elements do you feel less confident with? How would you enhance your knowledge of those areas? Um, who would you talk to to get that information? What courses might you go on? What training might you do? So you're asking the questions to support their own decision making process and their own thinking. It's important to recognize that mentoring is meant to follow the mentee's agenda, not the mentor's agenda. So if you're thinking about the power balance between these two individuals, it, the mentor is not really the person in charge of this situation. You're just supporting the process. Um, and in fact, the mentee should really be in charge or maybe an equal power balance there. Um, a lot of the time people do get mentoring confused with coaching. 
um, and coaching is more akin to the environment you'd be in if you were actually acting as a clinic tutor for this individual where you're teaching them things uh, and developing their skills that way um, and it has its it has its strengths and it's something that we're probably coaching something we're probably as osteopaths are quite comfortable with because we do it on a daily basis with our patients so if a patient comes into the clinic and you think they need a, a rehabilitation exercise program you will tell them that they need to do this many exercises uh, with this amount of weight this many times a day for this many weeks and to follow up with them in two weeks time to check that they're doing it correctly uh, and that is sort of your coaching them through that exercise rehabilitation process uh, it doesn't really help uh, them if you mentor them through that process. They're not going to come in and you're not going to say to them, well, what rehabilitation exercises do you want to do? <laughs> you're going to have to coach them through that process. But it also, coaching also has its limitations um, and mentoring has its strengths, particularly in an environment where the outcome of the discussion needs to fulfill specific criteria and the uh, values and the beliefs of the particular mentee. So if we go back to the example of helping somebody with their career progression, you could try and coach them through that process. You could say, these are the steps that I took to get to where I am in my career. And they could follow those steps and end up with a career very similar to yours. And they could hate it because what motivates them may be very different to what motivated you in the first place. So mentoring through the process, trying to encourage them to understand what's of value and what's important to them, uh, may have a much more desirable outcome. In reality, uh, in actual fact, you, there may be a little bit of overlap when you go out there and you're actually mentoring somebody. You may drop into a coaching style for a little bit and then come back to mentoring. But it's important to recognize that as osteopaths, we do fall into a coaching style very quickly. And it's often better to try and keep away from that for a, for a short period of time, it's keep with the mentoring, uh, because you can often get more from that. Um, if you do that. So it can be uh, giving a, a, a more desirable outcome that way. There are a number of mechanisms and channels that you can use to deliver mentoring. Um, so with respect to channels, face-to-face -face is obviously quite common at the moment. That's not really appropriate for obvious reasons. But with technology such as video conferencing, you know, WhatsApp, Skype, phone calls and follow-ups by email, uh, you can use technology to uh, overcome uh, these these issues uh, and that also is very useful if you are uh, working in a geographically distant location to your mentee so uh, using video conferencing you can mentor somebody in Glasgow even if you work yourself in Brighton uh, and it's worthwhile considering that when you're uh, setting up the mentoring relationship there are also different formats that you can use one-to-one -one, where you've got one mentor talking to one mentee is obviously the, the most common but absolutely group mentoring can be very helpful as well where um, you have a number of mentors working with one mentee and I can absolutely see how a regional society could do that occasionally where uh, you break into small groups of three or four somebody comes along with an issue they want to discuss and that person can then get support from a number of different mentors simultaneously which can uh, be even better so that may be something to consider as well so what are the benefits of mentoring? Well, that's quite obvious from a mentee's point of view, but there are lots of benefits to the mentor as well and to the profession as a whole. And I'd like to just touch on some of those points uh, to start with. So we're all in the profession because we want to help people. We want to get our patients better. Uh, and that's often what motivates us. Uh, and acting as a mentor for somebody and supporting them through their own professional, um, their own professional development can be really uh, personally very satisfying for you as the mentor that's the reason why i mentor other people because i i really enjoy it um, and if you want to help people it's the way of helping colleagues through um, difficult decisions uh, especially now at a particularly difficult time obviously it can be used to direct the cpd of the mentee and help with reflective practice this is a way of getting objective feedback on practice which is one of the um, requirements of the new cpd system but if you are the mentor and you're talking to your mentee and they bring up a subject you haven't really thought about for a while, um, you're a bit rusty, maybe you need to do a bit of background research to prepare you for the next session, that can obviously be classed as CPD for yourself as well. And if you record that, um, it can generally be classed as your own CPD as the mentor. 
it can be helpful to advance the career of the mentee and the mentor as well. Obviously, uh, if the uh, mentee is enhancing their clinical skills, that can help them to deliver their and develop their business. But if you were the principal of a clinic and you're supporting your associates using mentoring, then we know that the associates tend to be much more loyal to the practice. You end up uh, with a little bit more consistency of care across the practice, which uh, we know patients like. Uh, and that can help you to develop your own business. Um, and also it's worthwhile remembering that having these skill sets, uh, having this training and having experience of conducting mentoring with others on your CV can really help you to advance your own career if you chose to advance your career beyond clinical practice. So if you decided to go into education or work for the professional body or work for the regulator or work outside osteopathy, these are mentoring is a very valuable skill set to have on your CV. So don't forget to update your CV after this uh, workshop. We will all need these skills when it comes to conducting the peer discussion review. So you'll know that with the new CBD cycle at the end of the three year cycle, which for most of us is is uh, coming up, it's next year for most of us, depending on when your CP CPD cycle starts. We will have to conduct a peer discussion review with a colleague, probably another osteopath, but certainly another professional. There will be a tick box exercise as part of that. Have you done CPD in communications? Tick. Have you done CPD in clinical skills? Tick. But there's also going to be a section in that looking at have you made the most of this, this year's CPD cycle? How can you make the most of next year's CPD cycle? And the, the questioning that we, we're going to talk about today could be very valuable in that situation. So we're all going to need these skill sets at some stage. Obviously, from a professional point of view, uh, promoting a culture of collaboration and unity throughout the whole profession is absolutely going to help to reduce professional isolation within osteopathy and maintain valuable skill sets within the profession. And that's never been more important than it is now. So it'd be really useful if the whole profession can get involved in this process, can support each other so that we're stronger on the other side of this. This is a very busy slide. You don't need to read everything on this slide, but what this just highlights is that there are different areas of practice that mentees have asked for support in. So from the original research, this is reflected in the mentoring toolkit that I mentioned. Um, there are a number of key elements that osteopaths have asked for support in. Uh, and obviously clinical skills is, is a common one. Uh, so enhancing and refining your own clinical skills, you could expect that many osteopaths would want support and mentorship with that. But there are three main other areas that osteopaths have asked for support in, including uh, interpersonal and communication skills. So uh, responding to patients who are quite anxious or communicating with other healthcare professionals who aren't osteopaths, for example. Obviously, uh, personal professional development is a key element. Uh, Work-life balance, uh, career progression is the example that I've been using today. Uh, and now more than ever before, business development skills. So as I said earlier on, how do you use, uh, how do you use uh, social media to enhance your website? How do you make the most out of your, your website? Uh, how can you enhance your presentation skills so you can talk to uh, local groups and encourage patients to come to your practice? So when we're thinking about relaunching our practice, these skills will be useful. So getting together with oste other osteopaths to make sure we're all prepared for this may be a, a very valuable contribution to the profession. Uh, and so at this stage, it might be worthwhile considering your own abilities as a mentor and which areas you feel that you are strongest in and which areas you're less strong, you, where you might need to enhance your skill set, where you might choose to uh, signpost people to if you don't have the answers for them. So one tool that you would have all come across, and this might be a self-directed learning task that you might consider doing after this session, would be a SWOT analysis. SWOT is obviously uh, an acronym um, for strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and threats, or sometimes called barriers. Um, and in the toolkit, there is a uh, SWOT analysis grid you can use to record your think thought processes. And obviously, if you keep that, that's evidence of your CPD. So it might be worthwhile thinking about your abilities as a mentor and conducting a SWOT analysis for your abilities as a mentor. So maybe you will think about, have I mentored somebody else before? That might be a strength, you've experienced it before. Or maybe you've been mentored by somebody else before. What did you learn from that? What are the strengths that you've learned from that? Where are you most confident? 
Then you need to think about your weaknesses, where are you least confident? Are there any elements from this grid where you think you wouldn't be comfortable giving support to a mentee? Um, which elements uh, would you want to enhance? How could you do that? So what are your opportunities? How could you actually enhance your understanding? Uh, who could you talk to for support? Who could you, um, which courses could you do? Could you read the mentoring toolkit to get more information? Could you partner up with another osteopath that you know and trust to practice some of these skill sets? And then what are the barriers or the threats, the things that would stop you doing that and how might you overcome them? So that might be the first uh, uh, self-directed learning task that you might consider doing after this process. And uh, what's really useful to remember is that this can be a very valuable tool to use with your mentees as well. If, uh, for example, they come to you and say, I want to enhance my skills, but I don't really know where to start. If they're a bit stuck at the very start of the session, maybe you want to talk them through these questions, their strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, um, and threats or barriers. Okay, so have a go at that, see how it feels for you, uh, and then it might be something you can use with your mentees. So as I have mentioned uh, repeatedly, the, the mentoring toolkit already. So that covers a lot of these different tools. It's got different um, uh, templates that you might use with your mentees. It's got a lot more detail on all these different uh, structures. Something that we've been told by uh, osteopaths is that if they haven't mentored anybody before, having a model of mentoring or structure to mentor using that, that particular structure can be very reassuring. Obviously, if you're more experienced at this, you will tend to jump around with those structures a little bit more and be a bit more flexible, and that flexibility can be very useful. But when you're first starting out, it can be very reassuring to have a template. Like that. So we're going to go through that in detail in a moment. We talked about the SWOT analysis. You might want to give that a go. Uh, I'm going to talk to you later on about where in the mentoring cycle that might come in handy. G-Star questions, that's another acronym. Uh, that stands for uh, the different types of questioning that you might use as you go through the mentoring process. And we're gonna look at that in detail in a moment. You may want to record what uh, you've learned as the mentor and there's a mentoring record sheet available in the toolkit. The mentee will inevitably need to write some of this down for their own CPD. They want, might want to use a PDP, personal development plan uh, or a mentoring reflective log. That's all in the toolkit, uh, so have a look through those, uh, become familiar with those, and then use them if you think that they're necessary for you. Obviously, when you're recording that information, you're going to want to make sure that all the goals that they record are SMART goals, so the specific, realistic, measurable, uh, and time-phased. I'm going to touch on that before. I'm sure you've all heard of SMART goals before. We're just going to do a bit of a refresher on that in a moment. Obviously, the most important thing about mentoring is good communication skills. And in the toolkit on the last page, there's lots more uh, information about good communication skills, just as a refresher, stuff that you'll already be using with uh, your patients, uh, but may portal across very well to the mentoring environment. So this slide, as the uh, slide says, this diagram shows uh, the outline of a, a normal standard typical mentoring session. Uh, and that flow chart, I'm going to take you through that flow chart in a moment take you through the type of questions you might be using and where in the process you might be using those. And then I'm going to give you an example of somebody that I've mentored recently and how I put this into practice just to, to add a bit of perspective on that. So how does this work? Well, if you signed up to the mental matching software as a mentor, you would create a very short profile for yourself, the different areas that you'd be happy to uh, mentor somebody else in. There'll be a drop down list. You just tick the boxes that you would be happy to mentor another osteopath in. Your mentee will search the database, they'll find you, you can chat online to make sure that you're the right person for them. And then if you agree that you're gonna conduct that mentoring relationship, that's when this kicks in. That's when this flow chart is gonna be used, okay? So you've agreed that you're gonna meet up and the first thing you're gonna do is you're going to establish a relaxed and professional atmosphere. You're gonna decide where you're gonna have this meeting. Are you gonna do it face to face? probably not in the current climate, or are you going to do it by um, uh, video conferencing or over the phone, uh, depending on what works for both of you. It needs to be agreed between both of you. Uh, after that, you're going to look at what are the uh, purposes, so what's, what are the goals of the session? What do they want to achieve? And then, of course, setting the ground rules uh, and the expectations, both of the mentor and the mentee. Now, that's really important because uh, one of the main reasons why a uh, mentoring relationship might break down 
apparently is because uh, those expectations haven't been set in the first place. So it's really important to spend a few minutes, five or 10 minutes even at the start of the session, getting clarity on that from both people's point of view. Um, and it really sets you up well for the rest of the mentoring relationship. So we're gonna go through that in detail in a moment. Then you're going to explore uh, and uh, get a little bit more detail on the situation that the mentee is facing. So you have an idea of the goals that they have. So let's explore that a bit further. Let's unpack that. What does that look like? How big is it? How round is it? How many corners? So you have a really clear idea of what they're looking for. The big box in the middle is really then your role as the mentor for the majority of the mentoring discussion. So you're going to be there to clarify your understanding, clarify their understanding, determine their priorities. You may ask some challenging questions to help the mentee to develop their own understanding of the situation. They may not have thought through it that, that clearly, so you're going to challenge them and help them to think through that process. You may choose to draw on your own experiences on some occasions just to add perspective. And then you need to help them to build an action plan. How are they going to get around this issue? What do they need to do? Uh, you help to stimulate them to, uh, to develop that action plan and agree that between you and them. So that's the majority of the mentoring discussion. You'll then summarize that in, in some format or sort of record it in some way, maybe a personal development plan. As I said, there's a template in the toolkit um, and you'd want to make sure that your, your goals and targets are, are, are smart goals. Uh, at the end of that session, you're then going to decide with them, has this been a value? Have they got everything they need? Can you finish the mentoring arrangement at that stage? Or would they like a follow-up session? If they do want a follow-up session, maybe you'll set three additional follow-up sessions and you'll review after that. Uh, you'll review to see how successful those have been at that stage. Uh, and you'd agree the agenda of the next session. So it's not, not random. You think about exactly what you want to discuss at the next session. What are you going to follow up on? So that's a standard structure for a mentoring um, discussion, okay, for your first mentoring discussion. So I'm now gonna go through the sort of questions you might use in that discussion. And a good way of remembering that is G star questions. So those, again, this is all in the pack. Uh, G star is again an acronym uh, that stands for goals, situations, thinking, actions, and results. So um, if you look at the flow chart again, uh, the second box down looks at what are the purposes. So that's the goals. So how do you determine the goals? If you think about this in your patient consultations, that's where you ask them at the first new patient appointment, how can I help you today? Yeah, setting the goals. So you might ask, what are your goals of this mentoring session? Uh, what are your, your goals of today's discussion? What would give you most value today? OK, so you'll get a rough idea of what they're looking for. Then remember, this has to come from the mentee's agenda. So you need to unpack the situation. You want to make sure that you're not making any assumptions about their situation. So you want as much detail on the current situation as you can. So that's where the, the situation questions come in. So tell me a bit more about this situation. Uh, how, how do you feel about the situation? How would you describe it? How would you, um, how would you, you give me a bit more detail? So after that, you need to have uh, a think about where they are in their thought processes about this. So it may be that they've actually done quite a lot of thinking about this. They've actually thought the way through it. They've approached a few people. They've, they've conducted a few different activities and they've now reached a, a block. Or it might be that they're right at the start of their thought processes and they, they have a rough idea that they want to improve in something, but they don't know where to start. So that's where the thinking questions come in. So what are you thinking about this, this current situation? How far along the process are you? Um, what, uh, what, is your under, what underlying assumptions have you made so far? And so on. After that, you need to have a think about supporting them to um, develop an action plan to, to get around this. So that's where you might ask them, okay, so what courses might you do to get more information? Who might you speak to? Who do you know that might know the answer to that? Uh, you might signpost them to some suggested areas of, of research. What papers might you read? What newsletters might you sign up to so that you get information when it, when it comes through? So they'll, they'll come up with a huge stack of different actions that they could do 
it's then your job to help them to prioritize and sequence them so in which order would you do those which sequence would you do those which things would you do first because they won't have time to do all of them simultaneously one would, one would suggest so that's your action questions and then you want to make sure that uh, they've written it down they know what uh, they're looking to achieve what does the result look like how would you know when you're successful and um, how would you make sure it's realistic and achievable so that's where your smart goals come into effect a lot of information there. i'm going to give you an example now of how i've used this sort of structure with somebody i've recently mentored myself which was just just before christmas this happened so i had uh, another osteopath uh, email me they'd seen articles about me in osteopathy today they had an understanding of my career structure and they thought it was quite interesting uh, and they wondered if they could talk to me about how i'd done that so that they could do something similar so i suggested an entering session uh, and the the osteopath agreed um, she lives about three hours away from me so we decided to do it by video conferencing and by phone which we're both very comfortable with so it wasn't an issue for us uh, it did mean that there was no need for traveling um, and no costs involved in that either. So that's what we decided to do with respect to setting the, the relaxed and, and uh, professional environment for, for us. That's what worked for us. So we set that environment. My first thing I needed to do was to, obviously after setting expectations, what I could achieve for her um, and what uh, she wanted to, to get from me. And the first thing I needed to do was have a, a better understanding of what her goals were. So that's when I said, okay, you can contact me my, by email, you suggested, that you wanted to, um, to to have a bit of advice on career progression so um, let me know a bit more about that what, what is it that's the issue well i've been working for about five years um, i want to i'm really enjoying it i like being an osteopath but i want a bit more of a challenge i want to take things a bit further so we had that as the initial goals of the session now at that point i could have made lots of assumptions and decided right she's a new graduate she's probably working as an associate uh, she probably wants to enhance the clinical skills if i'd made those assumptions at that stage i would have missed a huge part of the problem for this particular colleague of mine uh, so that's where the situation questions come in so it's at that stage i said to her okay well tell me about your current situation tell me about your current career what are you doing where are you working how many days a week are you working how long have you been working in those environments we went through a SWOT analysis. Which bits do you really like? Which bits are your strengths? Which bits uh, do you really enjoy? Which areas do you enjoy less? Which areas uh, are you less confident with? And what I found out from that is, yes, she was an associate, but she was also setting up her own business. And in two months, she had two days of uh, full lists just in two months because she'd done a lot of public speaking to, to local groups. Um, and she got a lot of patience from that. She had done a lot of work with social media. She had built her own um, website, uh, which was very successful. And she, was, she did a, a blog, which was very successful, and that generated a lot of traffic to her business. So she had her private business. She was also working for a charity. She was doing a lot of charity work in the health sector. She was also running a local regional society. Um, and she had actually done a, a lot of um, publicity work. She'd actually been interviewed on the, the news and stuff about. Um, uh, elements of um, practice that are associated with osteopathy so she was really busy um, so those are elements I would have missed if I'd made those assumptions at the beginning so that's where those situation questions come in and really help to unpack the situation more so then I needed to think about this from her perspective I didn't want to make any assumptions from my own perspective I wanted to know where she was at with her thinking and um, how far along the thought processes she was. Was she right at the beginning? Had she started to, to develop some work to, to take this further? Because she was a very proactive individual. So that's when I came up with the thinking questions. And the ones I wheezed with her was, I said to her, well, that sounds great. That sounds awesome. Uh, what's wrong with that? So an open question. And that's where she came out and she said, well, the issue is that I've got so many things going on. I really enjoy the charity work, but it's all um, voluntary work. It's all free. Um, I don't have very expensive taste, but I do need to pay the bills. I'm getting more and more of that, and that's encroaching on, on the, the other stuff. I really enjoy my private business, but I haven't got enough time to, to, to um, make that work because I'm doing all these other things, and I don't really know where to go from there, really. 
And so that's where I thought it might be worthwhile drawing on my own experience to add a bit more perspective to the situation. So that's from the flow chart on the right there. So I said to her, okay, well, that sounds amazing. That sounds very similar to what I did when I started. At one stage, I was operating seven jobs per week, um, which I really enjoyed. And it gave me a really lot of information to put my CV, really helped me to enhance my CV. Um, but I'm a bit of a perfectionist. And I got to a stage where I didn't have enough time to make any of those initiatives work really well. So what I had to do was to decide what my top two priorities were. And I had to focus on those and put the rest on the back burner if I wanted to achieve what I wanted to get out of my career. And that's what she responded to that. She said, yeah, that's it. That's it, actually. It's that probably more of a work-life balance. I hadn't really thought about that. But yes, I'm a bit of a perfectionist. I want to make these work really well, and I don't really have the time to do that. So we unpack that further with the action questions. So you know, we, as I said, we talked about what her priorities were. So um, she said, you know, working her own private practice and the charity work was really great. But you know, it might be, you know, if she could get a job in the charity sector which was paid, that would help her to pay the bills whilst she focuses on her own practice. Um, so we talked about, okay, who could you talk to from your links and networks working with those charities to see what opportunities are out there? Could you go onto various websites to look at charity jobs, work out what the skill set that is required is? and look at your own CV, where are the gaps? How could you go on courses to, to fill those gaps? How do you get experience to fill those gaps? Um, which uh, e-newsletters could you get onto so that when these jobs come up, you're aware of them? Uh, and we set the, um, the order of priority for that, um, decided which ones she was gonna do first and so on. And I actually thought it'd probably take her about a year to, to develop her CV to a level where it was appropriate for her to apply for these roles. But actually, within two months, she'd spoken to one of the directors of a charity she was volunteering for and said, look, just so you know, I'm interested in this sort of thing. And they said to her, you know, that's amazing. You're a clinician. We didn't think you'd be interested, but we are just about to advertise a role. And I think you'd be excellent for it. Why don't you apply? But within two, two um, months, she's actually got an interview for the sort of role that she's really looking for. Uh, and that's how the, um, the mentoring discussion has helped her to clarify her thought processes, clarify her, her strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and barriers so that she can make the most of this. So it shows a, an example of where this can be really successful. So I did say I'd, I'd summarize SMART goals. So uh, in, in the, the latter section of that flow chart where you're looking at um, summarizing your actions uh, on the, uh, the left-hand side of the page where you're looking at developing the actions and developing the results, how do you know when you're gonna be um, successful? Is it achievable, is it realistic? How are you gonna measure when you've been successful? That's when SMART goals can come in handy. So as I said, SMART goals is uh, an acronym for specific, measurable, agreed, realistic, and time phased. Most of you probably come across this before, but just as a refresher, with mentoring, you're looking at making sure that the goals uh, are as clear as possible, they're as specific as possible, because that helps you to measure outcome and, and measure when you've been successful in delivering those. They should be measurable um, so that you know when you're successful, as I said. Um, they should be agreed between the mentor and the mentee because that encourages uh, commitment between both parties. They do need to be realistic. It should be challenging, but definitely achievable. So if your, your mentee says to you they want to be the best osteopath in the world, well, what does that even look like? That's not particularly specific. Is it realistic? Um, could they form a, a more realistic goal that is more achievable? And then it does have to be time phased. So when are you going to review the process to see whether what's, what you're doing is working? And when are you going to finish the process? Because the idea is that mentoring isn't meant to carry on for the entire life course of that osteopath. It's to help them through a particular scenario. And the idea is that it does finish at some stage so that they are self-directed learning and uh, you're not a, a, a crutch for them as such. You are there to support them through a process. And then the idea is they go away and, and they uh, continue um, on their own when they're feeling comfortable to do that. So this slide just goes through a little bit about the, uh, the actual cycle process of mentoring. So it is a cyclical process. It's not the case you do one, one session and that's over in many cases. Uh, you'll start off setting the aims and objectives of the session with the uh, mentee. 
Uh, it may be, you know, it's not necessarily that uncommon that the mentee comes along and they are right at the very start of their thought processes. They want to be better, they want to be better clinically, they want to be a better osteopath, but they don't know where to start. So that's when a SWOT analysis might come in really helpful. And you say, okay, well, have a think about this, explain to them what it is, go through them. They, they, they put down their strengths, their weaknesses, the opportunities for improvement, and any threats or barriers that might stop them doing that. And then you can talk through that on the first session. So that may help that process. You'll then continue by encouraging the mentees self-directed learning uh, and developing the, their action plan. Um, so that may be your G-star questions um, and the, the flow chart I showed on the last slide. They'll need to record that somewhere. So maybe the PDP, personal development plan or the reflective log. Uh, and when they're recording that, you're gonna encourage them to, to uh, record SMART goals, which we just talked about. And you're going to provide uh, ongoing support. So that might be a case of um, follow-up appointments that um, you can you ask them how they're getting on and support them through that if they have further questions. And then um, you will need to assess how successful you've been uh, some way down the line. So maybe after three or four sessions, how successful have you been? You may have one of several outcomes there. They may say, yep, I've got everything I need. Thank you so much. We can finish the mentoring agreement. Or they may say, well, I've learned a lot from this process, but it's thrown up other questions. Can we go through that cycle again uh, and answer some of the, the, the questions that are, are now uh, presenting themselves? Uh, or they might say, well, yeah, I've got everything I need, but I've got a new question now that I wonder whether you can help me with. And it may be at that stage that you can start the cycle with the, the, the new question, or you might think actually, somebody else might be a better person to help them with that. So that might be when you encourage them to go back to the mentoring uh, matching platform to find uh, a different mentor to support them on that process. The setting expectations, really important, as I said, because uh, if um, you are expecting to be there as a reflective friend, uh, a sounding board for them to bounce ideas off of, you're gonna support them through their thought processes and the mentee thinks you're gonna be their own personal clinic tutor that's going to lecture them for four hours a week for the rest of their lives, this is not gonna work. So setting expectations from the outset is really important. And there are a number of issues that you might want to consider talking to them about at the very start before you actually um, discuss the actual mentoring discussion stuff. Um, so um, there's some things to think about here and these are reflected in the mentoring toolkit, of course. So. What's expected of you as the mentor? What's expected of them as the mentee? What's the purpose and the, um, the goals of the session, obviously? Um, any topics that should be in scope and anything that shouldn't be in scope? So don't forget you're a mentor, you're not a, a counsellor. Sometimes it may be that you don't feel you have the skill set to deal with a certain issue uh, and you need to be confident enough to say, actually, I can't help you with this. Where else could you go to get that information? So you need to be clear about what might be off limits. The frequency, duration and location of the meetings goes without saying. Who has responsibility for arranging the mentoring meeting? So typically it's the mentee with agreement from the mentor. You may send them a chasing email to, to, to support them with that just in case they've forgotten, but uh, they're meant to be self-directed, of course. Confidentiality. And of course, when there might be exceptions to confidentiality. So um, if they did raise something in a mentoring session where they mentioned that they had actually broken the law, or if they said that their mental physical health was deteriorating to the extent that it was dramatically affecting their patient care, because of the osteopathic practice standards, you may have a duty of candor to report that. So they need to be aware of that at the very start. Documentation, uh, record, record keeping, who records what, you may want to record some notes as a mentor. If um, you, you know, you, you're thinking about following up in six weeks time, you might want to record what you discussed today so you can remember what you discussed at that stage, especially if you've got more than one mentee. Um, they will probably need to record stuff for their own CPD as well. Uh, and they need to expect to do that. Uh, you're not going to record that for them as the mentor. Uh, maintaining respect and agreeing how to disagree. So you may not agree with everything they say. Uh, don't forget you're following their agenda, not yours. Uh, they may not agree with the things you suggest, but that should be okay. You need to be comfortable. Both of you need to be comfortable to, to raise that. Uh, how to deal with conflicts of interest. 
how long uh, the mentoring relationship will last. So when will you actually review it and when should it finish? And that's really important. They need to be aware that this will finish at some stage. You're not going to be doing this forever. And setting those expectations makes it much easier to tie up the sessions at the end. Typically, individual sessions will last between 45 minutes and 60 minutes. And often you'd want to usually have about three to four sessions, though some people get everything they need in the first one and some people need a few more. But be, be realistic with them from the outset. And you also need to think about what to do if either of you thinks that the relationship isn't working. So you may be thinking, actually, I don't have the answers for this person. The relationship's not working. Um, there's been sort of a clash of personalities. They may feel the same. And that has to be OK. And you need to both be confident to actually raise that if that does happen. Uh, maybe make space for it at the end of the session. Have you got what you need from this session? If not, it may be appropriate to direct them back to the, the website to find a different mentor who could give them a different perspective, maybe. Uh, but there's more information in the toolkit on that, should you wish to. Uh, in the toolkit, there's also something called a mentoring code, code of practice, which effectively is a series of bullet points that you might want to discuss together. And it may help you to, to look at that with them um, and uh, run through that so that uh, you don't forget anything from the expectation setting section. Uh, so my second self-directed learning task that you might want to do, should you, uh, should you feel that's appropriate for you, is to find another osteopath, uh, a colleague, uh, an associate of practice, somebody you can meet up with at this stage, probably over video conferencing rather than face to face, and then role play the expectation setting section. And like I said, spend 10 minutes on it. Don't spend just a, you know, 30 seconds on it. Um, and it's a case of working through the process together and agreeing it together. It's not a case of the mentor saying, right, we are going to agree to this, 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 and this, and the mentee saying, yes, you need to agree to it together. This remember, this isn't the mentoring bit of the mentoring process, so you don't have to ask them. Oh, so what do you think that um, the mentor should be doing? What do you think the mentee should be doing? You know, this is a negotiation at the start to make sure the mentoring relationship is going to work for you. So, yes, by all means, uh, discuss that, negotiate that and make sure it's appropriate for both of you before you start mentoring question stuff. Um, and you might choose to use the code of practice, which I said is on page 24 of the, uh, the toolkit. There's also a mentoring agreement. It's not a contract. It's an agreement. Uh, it sets this out in a slightly different way. Some people find that that works better for them. Um, my personal preference is to go through the mentoring code of practice and discuss it verbally. Um, but you may choose that you want to go through the mentoring agreement. And again, that's in the pack, as I said. So that's the next activity you could choose to do. The last activity that I would really suggest you do and probably do as soon as possible to maintain your confidence and, and give what you learned today a go is to actually then spend 15 minutes actually uh, role playing uh, a mentoring session where you're actually asking these questions. So again, in groups of two, one person role playing the mentee, one person role playing the mentor, you'll, you'll sit down together or via video conference maybe or over the phone and you're going to role play an actual mentoring discussion. Um, so I've given you a scenario here that you might want to choose, but there are others, of course, and you may have others in mind uh, yourself already, uh, but you might choose to use the scenario we've been talking about as an example. Uh, your mentee asks for support regarding further career development to ensure that they develop a sustainable career alongside an acceptable work-life balance. So think about the skill sets you've used, think about the, the flow chart we discussed, think about the um, G-Star questioning. Uh, also in the pack, there's lots of tools you can use. Think about the SWOT analysis, think about the communication styles you might be using, which is in, on the back page of the toolkit, and role play through that. You might not do a whole 60-minute mentoring session, you might only do 15 minutes and then you'd swap sides. So once the other person becomes the mentor, you become the mentee. Uh, so you both give it a go. What you tend to find is that when you give it a go in a safe environment, you actually build your confidence very much quicker. So this might certainly be something that you might choose to do. It might be something you mentioned to your local regional society that you'd like to do. Give it a go uh, and practice it because uh, that's the best way of building your confidence. So thank you very much for listening. As I said, my email address is there. If you have any specific questions, uh, matthew at iosteopathy.org, email me. And I'll do my best to get through that over the next week and email you back. If there are some common questions that come up, I will try to put a frequently asked questions document together that I'll email round. 
um, please do consider signing up to the mentor matching platform. That's the link for the platform, io mentoring on pld.com. So sign up to that. You can sign up as a mentor. You put together a brief um, um, profile um, and then people can search for you. Uh, or even sign up as a mentee and, and get advice from the mentors who have already sent, signed up to that platform. It's free to use. There's many more uh, videos, uh, CPD videos on there that you could choose to, to use. Um, and obviously the mentoring toolkit is available on that site. Um, so thank you very much for listening. We will get through this situation together, but we do need to work together uh, to do that. So mentoring could be a really useful skill set to put into practice over the coming months to make sure we're all in the best position to relaunch our clinics once this is all over. Thank you very much.